Welcome to CLTV. Haven't done one of these in a while, but uh, I thought I'd put this up. This is me presenting to the local bar about the changes in law and procedure having to do with criminal law, things close to criminal law. This I do every year for the local bar, and I also do it for all the local police departments and the sheriff's department and pretty much anybody else who's interested, but usually it's kept pretty local. I go in, I break down personally, uh, read through all the past statutes and past bills, and read and figure out what criminal law has come out and what would be pertinent for practice in a real courtroom most of the time. So here it is. I'm going to give a couple disclaimers here. First of all, uh, while I'm, go I'm, I'm going to give a link to the actual document itself in PDF format, but uh, you should look it up yourself. Never trust what anybody else says. Do the research yourself. I, you know, what I say may have been a slight misinterpretation or a big misinterpretation. It's on you to look. So go look it up. And two, B, I can't remember what I started with, but the second one is this. Yes, I know my bow tie was screwed up through the whole thing. I didn't know at the time, and you'd have thought my buddy who was filming this would have said, hey, Ken, you might want to fix your bow tie. He didn't, and he thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> so don't get too distract distracted by how bad the bow tie is. And having said all that, let's get cracking. Initiating startup sequence. The number you have reached, 911, has been changed to a non-published number. Okay, let's start over again. Uh, we're going to start out with procedure. That's why the big black procedure is at the top is, of the page. Uh, and workforce, you'll be happy to know that your clients can go on workforce pre-trial uh, as long as they don't have a violent crime in their history. Uh, still be the jail's call, but they can go on. Transferring a juvenile, and previously, or previously, a juvenile can only be transferred for, to be to another locality, the locality where they lived. Once the there was a finding of guilt or not guilt, they changed that to it can be a finding of fact sufficient. So if your you know, your juvenile client's case is taken under advisement for six months or a year it can be moved to Norfolk or wherever they live, right? Um, protective orders, uh, it, the preliminary protective orders, the 15-day ones, right? Uh, they've clarified or they've made it the law is that just because the court is closed because of an act of God doesn't mean the, the, the order goes out, of, uh, stops working. So, you know, we get a blizzard, it lasts like five days, and Two days in is the day the protective order was supposed to come back to court. Come back to court. Protective <coughs> order keeps going until the next day court is, is in, in session. So it doesn't just stop. Bonds. Uh, if you have a, they, they clearly laid out when you're able to go to what court for bond hearings. You can, you know, you, uh, it'll be in district court unless there's a bail, you know, bail decision on appeal been transferred per the statute here from juvenile court and or it has been certified by a district court so if the judge has certified your uh, misdemeanor you can go to circuit court with it and if a higher court has made a decision on a bond hearing uh, you can't go back to the higher court or the lower court can't make a new decision unless there's a change in circumstance Bondsmen now, if they pull the bond on somebody and it's not uh, because the judge has issued a capius, if the bondsman pulls the bond on their own, then they have to give a reason for pulling the bond, and they have to turn in the money they've gotten to the clerk, at which point the judge will get to decide who gets the money, whether or not it's the bondsman or the defendant. Um, I've not seen this as much here. Y'all would be in better position to know this than I would, but... 
there were there were bondsmen around Richmond when I was there that would take really high risk people and then like a week later would pull their bond and just for no particular reason. And uh, I think that's meant to stop this. Or that this is meant to stop that. Multi-jurisdictional grand jury, if somebody's indicted by the grand jury, we have to tell you, defense attorneys, that they were indicted by the multi-jurisdictional grand jury, um, and or that we got evidence to the multi-jurisdictional grand jury to get their indictment. And then there's here's the <coughs> rules about what can happen if you get inf if you get the judge to order that you're allowed to have stuff in the multi. You have to maintain secrecy and all that sort of thing. You're not allowed to hand it out to the press or anything. Um, although you can use it for the defense of your client. If you lose it or it disappears somehow or the secrecy is busted, you have to tell the judge. So, what are you just talking about, transcript? Uh, it would be a transcript. Uh, it could also be things that the multi-jurisdictional grand jury had subpoenaed in. Oh. <laughs> Felony prostitution offenses. Anybody who's looked through this realized that this year the General Assembly went nuts about prostitution. Really, they kind of went nuts about pimps, not really prostitutes. But uh, anybody now who is convicted of a felony version of uh, prostitution, aiding prostitution, promoting prostitution with a vehicle, most of these involve minors, uh, receiving <coughs> money for prostitution, uh, all that's going to be part of a that's going to be a violent offense. So the next time they go in, they'll have a violent offense on their sentencing guidelines. DNA samples, if you're convicted under a local ordinance that is similar to a misdemeanor statute uh, that would have gotten your DNA sample taken, and now you'll be taking your DNA sample will be taken on the ordinance as well. Although it is very poorly, it's poorly written, you could read it and think it's just the last thing in the list that you uh, get DNA samples for, but that is not the purpose of what they were trying to do. Um, your intake officer now has to tell the district superintendent uh, if a of the school if a student is alleged to have made a threat of death or bodily harm. Uh, this is generally a threat made in writing. Uh, if they threaten to harm somebody at the school or school event or anything like that, uh, then it has to be told to the superintendent. The person that works at the uh, Department of Forensic Science is now allowed to have illegal items so they can test to see if they're illegal items. Apparently they weren't allowed to before, so <laughs> you change that statute. Uh, uh, victim, victims in not guilty of reason of insanity cases have to be given notice when somebody's going to be let loose or anything like that. Um, firearm rights rest restoration, same thing, you know, same process as before. They have to get their rights restored by the governor. Then they have to go to their court to get their right, get the uh, firearm back. They changed it from the statute saying they would have a permit to have a firearm to now it's a restoration order. And the big change I think is going to be that it's going to be, they're supposed to tell NCIC. So when an officer pulls somebody over the side of the road and the guy says, hey, I got my right back to the firearm six months ago, the officer can call dispatch and dispatch can say, it ain't in NCIC and they're going to end up getting arrested if it had. But so that should be, it should clear up a number of situations, really. Uh, civil abuse and neglect. If somebody is determined civilly to have committed abuse and neglect, and it's on appeal, uh, the and, but a criminal case is being investigated, that can, that appeal will get stayed for up to 180 days, or until the criminal case is disposed of. Law enforcement using drones. As we all know, they passed that statute a few years ago saying law enforcement can't use drones for search purposes unless it's something like an amber search or something like that, or amber alert. Uh, now they've made this exception, these two exceptions. They can use, if they've got an arrest warrant in hand, they can use the drone to go over the residence where they think the person's living at and make a plan on how they're going to arrest that person, or residing, or however you want to put it. And they can use the drone in a hot pursuit situation. So if somebody runs out of the woods, smacks an officer in the back of the head, and then runs back in the woods, I guess the officer can go get the drone out of his trunk and chase him that way rather than by foot. And, you know, maybe that would be an interesting one to argue in court with that's still hot pursuit at that point. But 
uh, they can use them. I assume that that's for more important things like you got six officers chasing some guy who's just shot at the bank or something. One of them could use his drone while well, the other five chasing that sort of thing. Uh, substantive crimes and jurisdiction, forgery. Forgery can be prosecuted wherever the issuer or the account holder loses money, basically. So Grandma Smith lives here in Wise and somebody has gone over and forged a bunch of checks on her in Kentucky or forged a bunch of checks on her in Tennessee. In theory, if the officer and the Commonwealth attorney could put, the, put together all that evidence from another state and bring it here, because Grandma Smith lives here and she lost the money here, we can prosecute here. Okay. Uh, same, now we've also got credit card. Credit card offenses can be tried where the victim lives. So now if the victim lives here, Grandma Smith, and somebody's got her card and they're using it in Texas, Oklahoma, and California, Zimbabwe, you know, Pakistan, wherever, if we can put together the evidence and bring all those people from Pakistan to prove our case, uh, we can prosecute it here because Grandma Smith lives here. Don't expect to bring, actually, I, this is not something that I think is going to hurt us terribly much or, well, it'll affect us some with Kentucky. Scott County, they have this issue all the time where people, you know, Grandma Smith lives in Scott County and the person goes over and spends the money in Tennessee, right? Because all the good stuff's in Tennessee, so they do that. Um, timber theft. Class one misdemeanor if you don't pay for the timber you bought within 60 days or time in the contract and three times the value of the, tim uh, of the timber as restitution. Not sure how that's constitutional, but the General Assembly has passed that statute, so it's there. Uh, if the seller asks the buyer for an accounting, uh, there has to be an accounting in 30 days or it's class three misdemeanor. Um, and you think you, you, you may laugh about this, but we get calls about timber theft all the time. Most time it can't be proven who took it or whatever, but we get calls about it. Uh, adult financial abuse. These are actually maybe something that'll do some good. Financial institution. Now, if they suspect that little Jimmy is cleaning out Grandma's bank account, they can refuse to cash the check or let him use the card or whatever for 30 days and they can turn it over to law enforcement for investigation. So hopefully that will do some good. I've seen too many uh, little old ladies get their uh, accounts cleaned out. Violent crimes, capital murder. If somebody kills a law enforcement or a fireman uh, and that person when they, when they do the murder is over 18, the punishment has to be at least a mandatory minimum of life and at most death, of course. Uh, this is in reaction to a case from a couple of years ago where I think the Supreme Court said, well, you know, yeah, it says life in prison, but it doesn't say mandatory minimum, so the judge can suspend all that time if he wants. And this is General Assembly saying, no, he can't, right? So kill law enforcement or firemen, you end up in prison for life, or you get death. DUIs for both cars and watercraft. They created a new crime, serious bodily injury caused while your DUI is a class six felony. Serious bodily injury is basically what you would find under malicious wounding or malicious injury, right? Uh, although they have a definition here down at the bottom. And permanent serious bodily injury, which used to be a class six felony, is now a class four felony. So they define serious bodily injury means substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain, disfigurement, for a loss and impairment of bodily functions. So it gave basically what you would get from malicious or malicious injury or, or malicious wounding. Assault on a medical worker, class one misdemeanor if somebody threatens to kill or bodily injury a healthcare worker while they're at a healthcare facility uh, unless they're there for mental treatment. So they got a TDO or whatever and they've been threatening to kill the officer, threatening to kill the magistrate, threatening to kill everybody and walk within 20 feet when they get pulled into the a uh, mental institute or a hospital and they threaten to kill a nurse, they're not going to get charged. But if some drunk idiot's in there and he threatens to kill the nurse, he can get charged. I think the difference between this and a regular assault and battery is this didn't seem to uh, require any actual ability to do it. Right? So if they're cuffed and whatever and they threaten to kill the nurse, 
then I think they can still be charged under this as class one misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. New stuff for sex crimes and children in the courtroom. Uh, admission of a, uh, evidence of sexual acts with children. Kids, they you know used to be 12 or younger if they, their statements from out of court could come in. Now it's 14 or younger. So they moved that up a couple years. All the other requirements that would fall in there are still there, but they've moved that up a couple years. And they've now added one more class of charges where the minor can testify from outside the courtroom via video, and that's commercial sex trafficking or prostitution stuff. Uh, beyond, below that, a person on the sex offender list cannot operate a taxi. Now, when they first wrote this a, a, as a bill, it said they couldn't operate a taxi and couldn't operate Lyft or Uber or anything like that, but they took out the part of the bill that said they couldn't operate Lyft or Uber. So you're safer, I guess, with taxi drivers. You know, uh, I think we probably all hoped that was true at least it was. Uh, prostitution, like I said, they went off all, all over the place on prostitution. Uh, promoting travel for prostitution. Class one misdemeanor if a travel agent promotes travel for prostitution, even if it's legal where they're going. So a uh, travel agent here in Y says, hey, you can go to Nevada. Prostitution's legal there. That's class one misdemeanor, right? Uh, Bangkok, uh, Dominican Republic, any of those places where people go for sex tourism, if the travel agent is stupid enough to say you could go there and engage in prostitution, then they've committed a class one misdemeanor. Uh, we, you know, I don't know how much we'll actually see this enforced anywhere in, the, in Virginia. I mean, the feds do this every once in a while, generally with pedophilia. pedophilia. You know, some guy will jump on a plane, go to some place in the, in, the, in the Far East, and then his excuse when he comes back is, it was legal there, and the feds just go, yeah, that's good for there. It's not legal here, and they convict him. So uh, kind of we're falling in line with that. A body house, for those of us who don't speak 17th century English, this is a house of ill repute, or to be very, very crude about it, a whorehouse, right? A if, house of agreeable ladies. Yeah, there you go. Uh, if you are running the body house, you're committing class one misdemeanor. I think you already were under the way the statutes were before. They just made it more clear that you are now. Aiding prostitution or using a vehicle to aid prostitution or promote prostitution is a class one misdemeanor, unless it involves a minor, then it's a class six felony. And anybody who recruits a, a prostitute is guilty of felony for every single act of recruiting a prostitute. The felony varies depending on how much uh, influence was used, force, etc. cetera, uh, but and they're, all, they're felonies. And, and what they, it was already illegal, they just made it clear that it ha it's for every single act of recruiting. Aiding prostitution and using a vehicle to promote prostitution now gets you on the sex offender list. Uh, it gets, you can be investigated by a multi-jurisdictional grand jury, and it's barrier crimes for child care, elderly care, or care for disabled. I don't think anybody here is really going to care too terribly much about the DSS's requirements here, so I guess we can move past that. Um, DSS basically just has to uh, investigate and provide a plan for making things better. Um, Photoshopped images. This thing here at the bottom, this is the statute that they put in place a couple years ago for revenge porn, right? If you break up with your girlfriend or she breaks up with you or whatever and then you know, all of a sudden you broke up with the girlfriend all of a sudden she sends out all the nude pictures you were stupid enough to send her, right? To embarrass you, to make your life miserable, whatever, to ruin your job, and all that. That's a class one misdemeanor. Well, now uh, they've made that, this thing down here at the bottom is about photoshopping somebody's pictures. So you were smart enough that you didn't send nude pictures of yourself to your girlfriend, and you break up, and she photoshops your picture on top of somebody who's nude and sends it out anyway, that's going to be a class one misdemeanor too. Okay. <coughs> Requiring clergy to report. Okay, clergy are now mandated reporters of child abuse unless there's some specific doctrine in their faith 
which says that they're not to. And the perfect example of this, obviously, is I'm Catholic. I go into confessional. I sit in my little box. The priest sits in his little box. I tell him whatever I tell him in there, and tell me he cannot tell anybody what I said. In there, right? He's not not allowed by doctrine of the church. That is not he does it's not no mandated reporting. But if I'm in the church hall and I say, hey, Father Ted, you know, you know, last week I slept with an eight-year-old boy and I feel guilty about it. That's not in the confessional, and that he has to report. Okay, so that's. Uh, I'll be interested to see if this actually comes out with anything. If, if we ever see any case law for that or anything. What, what about uh, what about uh, reports to bishops? You know, priest to bishop. Priest, uh, you have to be a priest to be a bishop. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's. I think that you're. I don't explain that to most people because most people. But I think that's. Uh, I think that's what they're aiming for. Really, stop all that. Safe Harbor, the Safe Harbor Affirmative Defense. A couple years ago, you recall they passed a statute making it Safe Harbor. If you if you're in a party with your buddy, you're all using drugs, and he ODs, you call it in to 911, and you wait and make sure EMT gets to him and that and he gets treated. You, it's an affirmative defense, of course, but you 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 can't be convicted of use of drugs and all that while you're there. Um, You'll recall, as initially passed, the person who called it in had to cooperate with law enforcement in investigating the crimes involved. Well, as of this year, the General Assembly has taken that part out. They do not have to cooperate with law enforcement. Basically, they just have to call it in and say, John's OD, and then wait and make sure that EMT gets there and treats him. Uh, again, it is an affirmative defense, but you know, uh, so if you're going to run it, at least look through the statute to make sure you get it all. But uh, basically, that's what it is anymore. You have to call in and make sure that uh, help gets to it. Child born addicted, it, uh, mandated reporting. If somebody, if a child is born addicted, it is not per se proof of child abuse or neglect. Uh, and where this is coming from is, I, I think if you're, if you're client is using heroin or oxys or whatever, they're still going to be found guilty. Well, I think this is, this is about subject right? Because we know what they do now. If somebody's addicted to all this other stuff, doctor gets a hold of them, and they're pregnant, he puts them on subject right? Well, no matter what the pharmaceutical companies are saying, when these kids come out, they're still withdrawing from something. It's not thin air. So they're withdrawing from the subutex, and this, I think, is meant to be you know, if the lady goes and gets subutex so that her kid doesn't die from heroin or get damaged from heroin or whatever, she's not going to get convicted. That's the only circumstance I can see where that's meant to apply. I think that's it. Uh, the wonderful change in the nicotine laws that everybody's ever so happy about. As of July the 1st, uh, under 21, you cannot purchase tobacco, nicotine vapor products, or alternative nicotine products, which I guess is like chewing gum, you know, Nicorettes and all that sort of stuff, or patches or whatever. Unless you are 21 or in the military, so I guess a lot of people <laughs> are going to join the military so they can keep chewing. Um, Got to say, I've been around doing the same thing for the law enforcement uh, departments, and they're not all that thrilled to go out and just start rounding up everybody under 21 who's got a can of skull, right? I'm sure they will if it's necessary, but they're uh, not the most thrilled about it. School boards are, you know, they were a lot of statutes about this, but I just summarized it here. The school boards have to basically make uh, procedures that will ban tobacco products and empty products. Paraphernalia. Basically, it is usually a paraphernalia item that's not legal if, you have, if you're using it to measure what kind or how much of dr certain drugs are in whatever drugs you've got, right? Well, they made it as of this year, fentanyl, the you know, paraphernalia that measures fentanyl is not included in that. So I guess the General Assembly doesn't want the, uh, want the Yahoo's dying of ODs and fentanyl. About the only reason to expect to understand that. Freon, which is fluorinated hydrocarbons, and Freon's replacement, which is hydrogenated fluorocarbons, because Freon is killing the atmosphere, so they found a replacement for it. 
it is now added to a class one misdemeanor to it's it's added to the list of, of those things you can't huff snuff inhale whatever you want to call it uh, and all the others are I, I include the list of all the others the reason freon was made illegal class one misdemeanor this happened like in northern virginia as i understand it kid got charged with uh with huffing freon went to court the judge said no not in the list can't convict him of it he got let out the door and then within a, a couple of days as i understand it he did a video of himself sitting there with a whole bunch of cans of you know i guess like keyboard cleaner or wd-40 <coughs> or whatever went, they can't do anything to me about this i can huff this stuff all i want and then died later that day from an overdose general assembly's reaction to that is to make it a misdemeanor at least they're moving in the right direction uh, New Schedule One drugs, as always with the Schedule One drugs, you have to be a chemist to understand what any of these things are. So we're just going to kind of skip that whole list. Uh, well, with the exception of on the on the last page, fluoroprazolam, fluoroprazolam, ah, who knows, whatever. That's a benzodiazepine, but it's never been legally sold anywhere in the United States, so it's out there. there. New Schedule Two drugs. The most interesting one of these is. Now, demodine, which is a treatment for opioid-induced constipation. So if your client is using opioids, the General Assembly wants him to be constipated. <laughs> so i got to assume you can get high off this stuff, too, but who knows. Uh, and they've made gabapentin, neurotin, uh, a Schedule Five drug. kind of wish they had been <coughs> made that a little higher, but that's what they've done with it. Naxalone can be regional jail employees can possess Naxalone if it completed the training program. Hemp and CBD now legal to deal. I probably should have said sell industrial hemp products. Uh, so if you want to go out there and sell hemp ropes and hemp shirts and all that stuff, <coughs> more power to you. You're allowed to now. Well. Uh, there is licensing for Licensing for growing, yeah. But uh, it can be sold. School nurses can now possess cannabinoid oil or THCA if the student has a script. The student basically got a script. And there's these registered agents uh, can now possess it if, it if they're dealing for a minor or incapacitated adult if they uh, got permission ahead of time. Um, and they have to be registered by the board and all that sort of stuff. Uh, interesting one, animal remedies. They specifically uh, excluded cannabis plants from animal remedies. So uh, anything that would apply to misusing animal remedies doesn't apply to cannabis plants. I guess your dog can get high, but you can't. So there's that. Uh, licensing, if somebody gets... Their life, it, it gets convicted of a drug offense in another state, they can get a restricted license in Virginia now. Traffic laws, here's the other kind of big one of this year. I don't know why they didn't pass it as a statute, they didn't pass it as a bill, they passed this as part of the budget. <clears throat> so, when you ask me what statute I'm gonna refer you to, I ain't got one. I refer, I'm gonna refer, refer you to the budget bill and good luck reading that whole thing. But basically, if a person uh, you no longer can lose their license for having their license suspended for not paying fines, costs, forfeitures, restitutions, or any other penalty. So they don't pay these things, they can't have their license taken away. Uh, me, uh, as well, as of July 1st, if their license is suspended for any of those reasons, they can walk into DMV and say, I want my license back, and DMV has to give it to them for free. So this doesn't, this doesn't apply to people who've lost it for insurance. It doesn't apply to people who've lost it for DUIs and all that. It's just people who've lost it because they haven't paid fines, costs, restitution, et cetera. Okay? They may charge them the renewal fee, 35 <coughs> bucks or something. Not supposed to. That's, at least that's not the way I read it. That's what they're charging. Yeah. Well, and you, you see the last line, shall waive all fees. Yeah. So they shouldn't be charging them anything. Um, let's see, handicapped parking. You can't park in the striped area next to the handicapped parking uh, space anymore. 
uh, which I thought was illegal already, and I've been passing up some really good parking spaces over the years. So, uh, but you cannot park there. Flashing lights. They've again rewritten the flashing light statute. I think this is the third or the fourth year in a row. Uh, but, okay, <clears throat> you recall they originally wrote it as reckless driving, then they changed it into a uh, just a, a regular old citation, and now they've redone it again. It's the same rules as before. Somebody's coming down the road, there's a car with the flashing lights, we're talking, you know, turn rotating flashing lights or, or specific, not just, you know, your general hazard warning lights, but other lights. If they come past this car and it's two lanes, they have to pull the left-hand lane, or they have to slow down if they can't get to the left-hand lane and go past cautiously. If they don't do that, and it's red and blue lights, right? It's red and blue lights, that's reckless driving again. So it's moved back up to reckless driving for officers and ambulances and stuff like that. If it's just a vehicle with amber lights, you know, recall UPS trucks were, were allowed to have amber lights a couple of years ago. Uh, those kind of, they're just something with amber lights or tow trucks, right? Uh, then it's just a citation again. If they go by and because they're going by and uh, they don't pull over the other lane and they hit somebody or something and cause damage, that they can lose their license for a year. If they kill or injure somebody, uh, they can lose their license for two years. Although I suspect it'll be the least of their worries at that point. We'll probably be prosecuting for something a little bit more serious. And there's a new class of vehicle that can use uh, amber lights now. Vehicles that haul trees, logs, or any other forest stuff now can have amber lights on their vehicle. Uh, using a phone in a work zone, I'm confused by this one because they passed this law last year, and I, they passed it, apparently it disappeared somewhere in the ether. So they repassed it again this year. And if somebody drives through a work zone and they got their phone in their hand or any other handheld personal communications device, generally that's always gonna be the phone, uh, they could go through the work zone that is a $250 fine. It's not $4,250, sorry for the misprint. It's a $250 fine for going through the work zone with the phone in the hand, and it is, as best I can tell, a primary offense, so the officers can stop your client right away. Uh, I will tell you, the officers have asked me several times whether I believe this applies only to when work's going on, or if I think it applies to places where, they're, you know, where they've laid out a work area and have barrels and all that up. I think it applies to even if there's no workers going on at the time because you've already got a, you've got a restricted driving area and more obstacles up, right? So I think it would still apply, but we'll see if it, how that plays out in court. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to ask. Cause sometimes you have a sign that says work zone, and then you drive and there's, there's nothing. It's just the sign that says work zone. Not even, you know, like things are done, you know, there's no... Yeah, I've seen that. You, if, you, if you're early enough in the morning on 23, you, or maybe 58, probably 58 too, they, they just put the sign down, they haven't started doing anything or got the trucks out. Yeah, I know. That, I, it, I, I suspect in those cases we probably wouldn't convict somebody of that, you know. Uh, but what I'm talking about work zones that are already laid out with all the junk out there, you know. Uh, no longer, things that can no longer be complied with law. All these here were already illegal and already carried the same punishment that they have laid out here. Like class two misdemeanor, if you uh, have, use a fake or, or a registration or a license plate or whatever, and you already know, and you know it's bad, or one from another vehicle. Class two misdemeanor for not turning over your license or registration when DMV tells you to turn it over. And class one misdemeanor for giving false information to get registration and all that, right? All that was already illegal, already carried the same punishments, except you used to be able to comply it with law. Uh, and now they've moved to a statute where you cannot comply with law anymore. So none of those comply with law now, can be complied with law. Uh, on the other hand, they did make expired registration something that can be complied with law. Uh, so if somebody registration runs out, they can get it fixed and get the judge to comply it. Failure to have insurance, that of course is still something you can get your license suspended and they've changed what you have to pay to get your license back from $500 to $600 because you know if you can't afford to pay for insurance 
you can surely afford to pay $600 to get your license back on top of the extra super expensive insurance that you're now paying for, right? Uh, sorry, cynicism, I guess. Uh, the, uh, I've never been a fan of that section. Uh, tenting laws, if somebody works for a private security firm and they're a canine handler, they can't, uh, they don't have to obey all Virginia's tending laws. Uh, I guess the dog doesn't get scared by the sunlight or something. Property owners, now this is not a new statute. Property owners have been able to mobilize cars that are on their lots for a while. I don't know when that statute first came into place, but previously they had to use a boot, right? So. If Walmart decides to enforce, you know, trespassing rules, and uh, <clears throat> they can go out and put something to stop your car from running, and you have to pay twenty-five dollars to uh, be able to get your car free. Okay. The uh, previously that had to be a boot. I don't know what it would be now. I mean, anything. Maybe there's going to be electronic devices that can keep the electronics in your car from working or something like that. Um, I'm scared that some of them might get really proactive and start slicing tires, tires or something stupid like that. But uh, it's out there. Seatbelt exceptions. Officers don't have to use all the, you know, I don't know what all the requirements are for, I think it goes up like eight years old or whatever, special belts and seats and all that stuff you have to have for kids now. My dad just used to throw me in the back of the truck and get me from point A to point B. You know, uh, but now you got to get all the stuff. Officers don't have to. They're transporting a six-year-old kid to intake. They don't have to have all the special equipment, right? Now, if they're transporting a baby, they do, unless it's actually in circumstances. Trying to get a baby to the hospital so it'll survive, they can go without a seat, right? They don't have to have a baby seat. If they just want to give some mom and her kid or one-year-old a ride, they can't do that. So that's where we're going. <coughs> Take care bags. Anybody who sells, installs, or whatever, a counterfeit, non-functional fake airbag has committed a Class 1 misdemeanor, which I suspect we won't find out about until the wreck, you know. Um, next, a handheld photographic LIDAR. This is only for VSP. You recall that Virginia has pretty much made it not legal to use the photographic system, you know, photograph somebody uh, speeding or photograph somebody going through, uh, through a stoplight and, you know, they pretty much made that localities cannot do that, right, and then send you the ticket three months later. Now, they can do it for tolls and stuff like that, and anybody who's been in the peninsula or anywhere near D.C. has gotten something three months later saying you owe us money, right, I'm never knowing you're on a toll road. Well, this is the exception to the, to the first part we're talking about. This is the exception. VSP can use photographic devices that photograph speeders going through work zones, and they can mail the ticket. The work zone has to be has to have that sign talked about, marked it, has to be designated, uh, and there has to be a sign saying the device is being used. But they can do that, and they're going to be allowed to mail tickets to to the owner of the vehicle, presuming that that's the person who was driving. So we'll be back where we're before with those. Uh, I, you know, they haven't expanded it any further. It's just work zones with VSB. So, vehicles on sidewalks, they they had to go back in and, and make it clear that somebody who is uh, disabled can use their vehicle, which lets them get around, travel on sidewalks. This has become a bigger deal in a lot of the big cities nowadays because I don't know if y'all have seen it, but you know, like I went to Charlotte a couple months ago to a, go to a hockey game. And every corner had like six or eight scooters sitting there, right? And the people's all over the place. So, you know, you go, you swipe your card, you pay, I don't know, a dollar, five dollars, whatever you pay to use them. And they just go all over the place using these things. Uh, and technically, that wouldn't be legal on the sidewalks in Virginia, right? Legal on the street, I guess, but not legal on the sidewalks. And, but they wanted to make sure that if you are handicapped, or whatever the correct PC term is nowadays, uh, if you're disabled, that you can use your little scooter that you've got that you sit down in, right? Then you're good with that. We don't have to worry about the tickets things, not until we get 40,000 people, so <coughs> that doesn't really matter to us. All the etc. statutes, all the others kind of left over. Causing someone to call the police. 
He caused someone to call the police for by pretending somebody got murdered, manslaughtered, or there was arson, then you've committed uh, class one misdemeanor. So I walk over to Walt and I go, bang, my gun's got, you know, just caps in it, or, or blanks in it, bang, Walt falls over, hits himself in the chest with a ketchup packet, and, and then, you know, Susie calls 911, we've committed a class one misdemeanor. Susie's off the hook, you know, so. That's what that's about. Fake caller IDs, I'm sure you will all be thrilled to death to know that all those people that call you at 10 a.m. in the morning or 7 p.m. at night and go, your warranty may be about to run out, or thank you for staying at you know such and such inn or whatever. Those people who are using false IDs, false uh, phone numbers saying they're from Lee County, Norton, or Abington, which seem to be the three that I get most of the time, uh, those people are committing a class three misdemeanor. And if they do it more than once, they're committing a class two misdemeanor. And I'm sure that every police department and sheriff's department here will be beating the bushes and going to Texas and New York and the Caribbean trying to find these people so we can charge them. Uh, it, it's a step in the right direction. Hopefully they'll someday find a solution. Uh, right before July the 4th, the General Assembly was kind enough to tell us what permissible fireworks are. If your fireworks don't fit under this list and you don't have a license, you know, all the cool stuff you can buy in Tennessee and Kentucky, uh, if you don't have a license for that stuff, you committed a class one misdemeanor. Nice of them to give it, they give it out just before 4th of July. Contempt charges. JDR, this statute here uh, for contempt, uh, basically if somebody doesn't come to court now for you know, felony or misdemeanor or summons or whatever, they have to be charged under 18.2456, not under the JDR statute. And they added a specific section for this in uh, 18.2456. Anybody who doesn't come to court, you know, after they've been charged with misdemeanor or felony and, or have a summons, they uh, don't come to court, well then they've uh, committed uh, contempt. Judge has to write down under which subsection of the contempt statute that he's person's charged and punished now, and that it still doesn't keep us the Commonwealth's office for going out and charging your person with the felony failing to appear in court or the misdemeanor. We don't usually do the misdemeanor one, but felony failing to appear in court, we can still do it. Gambling. Uh, in case you've reread this three or four times, you couldn't figure it out. Like I pretty much couldn't. I had to go back and look to see what they were trying to do here. What they're doing is stopping sham purchases here. This is making sham purchases illegal. So guy comes in and, he, and you go, here you go, packet of gum, $50. Guy buys a packet of gum for $50 and then out of the kindness of my heart, I let him spin this wheel over here where he can win $10,000, right? Just out of the kindness of my heart, I can do this for any customer, any person who walks in the door, right? Uh, and so, you know, apparently that, has worked somewhere in Virginia as a, as a way of uh, gambling, and this is the General Assembly's way of shutting that down. So, abuse and neglect of an adult with permission can't be convicted of, this is probably more neglect, of abuse and neglect of an adult if you have permission ahead of time. This is things like advanced medical directives, do not resuscitate orders, or if somebody's very religious and their religion says, you, thou shalt not use medicine or certain types of medicine or something, and they make sure whoever's going to be their guardian, if they're if they're going to become incapacitated, knows that uh, the person not giving them medicine, not resisting that, has not committed an abuse and neglect. Right? Now it's an affirmative defense; they're going to have to prove it, but it's out there. Uh, Non-picture ID cards; these are brand new this year. At age 15 or older, if somebody has a religious reason. That they can't have their picture on an ID card. Not a driver's license, you still have to have a picture if you got a driver's license. But if you want an ID card without a picture, you can get one. There's a whole bunch of hoops they have to jump through for this. I didn't put all the hoops in here, but there's a whole bunch of hoops they have to jump through to get it, but they can get it. Uh, and so we, I imagine, will start seeing a few of those pop up here and there. They are not, you know, anybody who gets one by lying, it's class two misdemeanor. Anybody who gets one so they can commit a felony has committed a felony. 
So, there. Exceptions to the conflict of interest laws, they fiddle around with these every so often. Uh, if somebody is a school superintendent and a family member uh, gets a job in the school, uh, in the school system, and the superintendent, su uh, superintendent certifies that he had no business at all in that hiring decision, and the deputy superintendent says, yeah, he didn't have any business at all in that hiring decision, and they just got hired on merit, uh, and then it's basically not a conflict of interest. Uh, so, always those are always interesting laws. Drones, nobody can land, a, it's class one misdemeanor if you land a drone on federal aviation land or US uh, security sense of airspace, if you land it. Now apparently if you fly it through the air, because that's federal airspace, it's not a state crime, it's a federal crime if they choose to prosecute you. Uh, but if you land it, that's both federal and Virginia land, and we can do a misdemeanor against you. I'm not sure where that would apply, or if that would apply anywhere around here, unless we uh, get an Air Force base real quick or something. Uh, apparently, what this is is uh, locals. This has happened in other parts of the state where there are some of these places, and uh, the people running the airports or whatever are complaining because these drones are landing, and it's a, it's already a federal crime, but the feds won't do anything about it. So now we're passing a statute. And now we get to the animal sections. Pets. If you are representing someone who has a dangerous dog or the dangerous dog claim itself, if somebody, if there's a claim the dog is dangerous, the judge can now take that under advisement. Set conditions, and if the conditions are met, then dismiss it. Right? Uh, animal cruelty. They clarified that animal cruelty doesn't have to be the owner, it can be anybody. Uh, they added serious bodily injury to dogs or cats, pets, uh, as a class six felony. So if you go out and beat your neighbor's cat, and, uh, uh, but don't kill it, it's, all, it's a felony too. It was already a felony if you killed it. Walt's giving me a look like, what? You can't kill a neighbor's cat? Uh, the, uh, uh, it was already a felony to kill it, now it's a felony if you seriously injure it. And serious bodily injury for animals, they're exactly the same things they are for serious bodily injury for humans. They took the same language uh, from the other statute. So it's risk of death, physical pain, <laughs> uh, you know, disfigurement, law, impairment of function. Locality can pass a statute to keep dogs from running at large, uh, except dogs are used for hunting. This is an anti-packing statute, right? But apparently some places have had problems where you know, everybody in the neighborhood's letting their dogs run, and they pack up in a pack of eight or ten dogs or whatever. They did make exceptions for people like Chad back there, so he can still run his dogs, you know. But uh, the uh, if you're if you're a regular person and regular dogs, and your dog's out there running and it packs up with the eight or ten other dogs, you can get charged a hundred dollars for every dog in that pack. So this is the anti-gang statute for dogs. Pretty much, yeah, <laughs> exactly. They have to pass an order. Yeah, they have to pass the ordinance, so you're right. Um, adequate, uh, adequate shelter for dogs. During hot weather, they got to be properly shaded, and it has to be something that doesn't readily conduct heat. In cold weather, they have to have a windbreak at the entrance and provide uh, bedding in there. And, you know, for those of us that have dogs and do that sort of thing, you know full well what happens. You put the doghouse out, you fill it with wood chips, and they go sleep underneath the picnic table anyway, <laughs> on the ground, right? But... You know, that's, it's the law. Wild critters. You cannot shoot a wild bird or animal from your, from a vehicle unless the vehicle is stationary on private property with permission or ownership, and uh, you're shooting a nuisance animal. Which Here's the list. Blackberries, coyotes, crows, cowbirds, feral swine, grackles, which is a small bird as I understand it, English sparrows, and starlings. So you want to sit in your car and shoot English sparrows, you can't do it as long as you're on your own private property. There used to be an exception for handicapped hunters. Wasn't there? Did they get rid of it? Or? I have to look, to be honest with you. I know there were exceptions as of like last year or the year before. They allowed them to have their blinds down on the ground as opposed to up in the trees. But I'd have to look and check the rest of that. Uh, penalty for wanton waste. And this is uh, what the definition is I took, checked is if you shoot the deer, but you don't go chase it down to finish it off, and it just dies in the woods and all that, that's wanton waste, right? 
that sort of hunting without finishing the animal off, basically. And as I'm sure I've heard some chuckles already from this, the uh, animal control officers can confiscate tethered cocks now. What's so, that? I'm sorry. Uh, I think you heard it the first time. Uh, and that's pretty much it, folks. Any questions about anything that, that what, came what up? What do you mean by tethered? <laughs> I think that may, may be up to the imagination of. <laughs> Say again? Is it to the petitioner to try to get their firearm to ride okay. to try to No, the petitioner, in, in firearm restoration, petitioner, as of the passing of this law, it's not on him to notify NCIC that, that he's gotten his license back, or he's got his right to have firearms back. It's supposed to be done through the court, court's office. Anything else? Bueller, Bueller. I'm obviously missing something. Okay. So if there is a dog that is charging at your child and you kill it, are you saying, I mean, I know you'd have a defense of others' defense, but they can still charge you with the felony? Well, we could, but I don't see that happening. It's, it's clear exception in the law that if you're defending yourself or others or livestock or eight your I mean, animals. Okay. Not. I mean, they're charging people killing bears for that same reason, so that's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, I don't think we have. Have we got that charge going? At least one case in Lee and at least one case in Wise I know about. Yeah, that's interesting. Wise, that we charged somebody for killing a bear that was attacking the person? No, that was charging. Well, they said that's an attack. They <laughs> said it was charging. They said it was charging. I mean, well, no okay. one knows except for the bear and the human with the shotgun, but. The bear you know. can't write a check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if the animal's attacking you, you're. Other people or you know domesticated animals, you you're allowed to defend. So and there is a statute that's attacking your livestock. You can kill it. That's yeah. Anything else? Well, you think you had something there for a second? No. Uh, go forth and have fun.